Thanks, Jonathan, um, and thanks to all of you who are here, but who also uh, year by year make this um, happen. It's very important, and uh, that needs to be said. And thanks to all the presenters, but I want to make a special thanks to Chad um, <clears throat> for what he said this morning. And I also need to say one other thing about that. Chad and I did not talk about what we're speaking about here. <clears throat> I didn't talk to him or ask him what he was saying. He didn't ask me. And neither of us saw what the other one has figured out. But uh, I believe you will see their intersections. <laughs> And I want to express my gratitude to him for that and for the work that he's doing on his dissertation about Cantor's. On May 10th of this year, the 100th anniversary of Paul at Oman's birth, Mount Olive Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, where Mons had been the Cantor, hosted a hymn festival remembering him. David Sherwin, the current Cantor, played, and Paul Montz's son, Pastor John Montz, provided the reflections. John referred to an unusual thing that his dad had done, preached a sermon. Sometime between 1983 and 1992, when Paul Montz was the Christ Seminary Seminex Professor of Church Music and Artist in Residence, at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, he preached a sermon at Wallace Memorial Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was titled, Praising God in Words and Music. John referenced that sermon until he got to the last reflection. When he got to the last reflection, he said, when Paul was born, the rule was that the father could not be in the room with the mother and the newly born child. Some of us still remember that rule in our own lives. Otto, Paul Mons's father, however, somehow sneaked into the closet next to the room where Hulda and Otto were, and he sang lullabies to them until he got kicked out. <laughs> so I asked John after the hymn festival if he made that up. He said, no, it really happened. It was apparently remembered in the Mons family. Now, I don't know if that memory influenced the sermon that Paul preached, but it is interesting that in the sermon, he mentioned lullabies twice. He said, I sometimes wonder whether the writer of Genesis heard God singing the creation into being. In those words, I hear strains of a parent lullabying a newborn child, awaking with familiarity to a dear voice. Later in the sermon, he pointed to the importance of the finest crafting of music in connection with the teamwork of the musician, the clergy, and other staff who plan together for weekly worship services. Then in addition to the planning for Sunday morning services, he noted two other occasions where teamwork is vital. One, he said, is for weddings, and the other one is for what he called the final lullaby, the funeral. Mons also said that if God could sing, could lullaby the world into being, the response 
of the church must surely be to sing. If you think about that a little, you see that in his sermon, Mons was giving five characteristics of church music. God's lullaby, our song, teamwork, our craft, and God's gift. First, God sings us into being with a lullaby. That lullaby is second, echoed in our song by means of third, the teamwork of fourth, the crafting of fifth, God's gift of music. And Mons set those marks in context. He cited Paul's thanks in the opening words of the letter to the congregation of Philippi. Paul's words, said Mons, are about, quote, the congregation's life tied up with his own, even though he is in prison. That life together, he said, includes prayer with joy, thankfulness for partnership, and partaking of grace. Mun said, this doesn't sound like words to me. It sounds like a new song to the Lord. And it is, his words, good theology. And then he added this. The powerful melody is the great love of God who sent his son into the world to carry the burden of sin, alienation, and death. The unearthly harmony sings about the first being last, the greatest being least, and a kingdom composed of children. Mons here gets at the essence of the church's song. Like Mary's Magnificat, the church's theme song, in its music, the church magnifies the Lord for showering us with love and raising up those who are the most vulnerable. That is, singing to the glory of God leads to caring for one another in an unearthly kingdom. We like to celebrate virtuosity. That's not a bad thing. But the message of the church and Mons's faithful example tell us that our virtuosity, like all of our works, is a response to God's gift, and that it is contextualized by the grace of God in the community of the first being last, the greatest being least, and a kingdom composed of children. Virtuosity, when used faithfully, responds to the melody of God's love and the harmony of the community it creates. So why does Paul Mons matter? Because love in community matters. Because the church's musical vocations matter. Because faithful musicians who have lived out their vocations matter from the anonymous ones to the ones we know something about, like Hildegard, Johann Walter, Palestrina, Heinrich Schütz, Dietrich Buxtehude, J.S. Bach, and Mons himself. All of the faithful servants, in all of their various callings, matter. Teachers, janitors, truck drivers, nurses, farmers, parents, cooks, whatever. Too often, we emphasize only the clergy's call and neglect all the rest. All the rest. We are especially tempted to neglect the high and holy calling of the church musician. If we remember musicians at all, we are likely to think about their musical skills, how well they played, how well they composed, or something like that. 
skills, as I indicated, are important. They should not be forgotten. They should be celebrated. But they are to be celebrated in context. The context is God's love in the communal song of the church. The musical skills God gives us are called on to help us sing for the glory of God and the good of the neighbor. Paul Mons lived out that vocation, and that is why he matters. Mons articulated this vocation in words in his sermon and in some other places too, like um, John Ferguson's and Joy Lawrence's A Musician's Guide to Church Music. But even if he had never done it with words, we would know it from his music. The work of the church musician issues from a common responsibility to lead the church's song around word, font, and table with the finest possible craft, not anything thoughtless or slovenly. But it is not carried out with exactly the same skills, resources, and needs from time to time, place to place, or person to person. We sometimes disagree about the details of how we should carry out our callings. But whether or not you agree exactly with what Paul Mons did or not, it is clear that he was not doing the world's musical business as usual. I sensed this the first time I heard him play. I think it was at a chapel service during a summer session of the Schola Cantorum at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. There was no music until the hymn. When Mons began the hymn's introduction, I wondered what was going on. That reaction had two parts. The first one was what I always thought when I heard a fine musician. Why was a person with moderate musical skills like me in this business at all? That reaction quickly evaporated, however, when I realized something much deeper and more important, that this was not the world's musical business as usual. Business as usual, playing a gig, was what I often sensed musicians who happened to be playing in church were doing. Mons was doing something different. He was responding with the finest musical craft to the meaning of the hymn. Words were taking musical flesh. Mons was preparing us and then leading us to sing meaning. Musical skills were helping us sing to the glory of God for the good of the neighbor. Paul Mainz's example leads us beyond ourselves to the essence of our vocations. Mainz, like other faithful musicians, teaches us to say to ourselves and to one another what I have continued to learn and have repeatedly told myself and my students, it is not your job to be Paul Mainz. It is your job to be who you are and to use whatever talents God has given you as well as possible. You can learn from Paul Mons, now get busy. That is why Paul Mons still matters. We should celebrate his skills as we should celebrate the skills of others who have faithfully lived out their vocations. But Mons joins them in teaching us something deeper. He learned from the teamwork of the church's musicians and those with other vocations how to put our skills to work. His example encourages us to pursue our vocations in the places where we are called to use our skills among the people we serve with their skills and their resources. 
We should be very clear about this. It is no small thing. While there are exceptions, like this school and these lectures, the church and its schools have too often dismissed church music and the vocation, the high and holy calling of the church musician. Church music is a barometer of the church's health. If you want to know how healthy a church is, listen to how it sings. That will tell you far more than any numbers or statistics. Dismissing church musicians and music is not a good idea. It is not healthy. It represents a collapse of the church into the fallen world, into its market as God, with musical jingles calculated to sell Christianity as one more product, with warring factions of winning for the sake of winning, with no moral code, and with an absence of concern for the common good. Paul Muntz reminds us that church musicians lead the church's countercultural message in a subversively constructive underground song of resistance in our fallen world. The Confessing Church and the Barman Declaration of Nazi Germany expressed this explicitly. But the church in its song sings this same theme at all times and in all places, even when it is not explicitly stated in spoken or written words. We sing praise to God, confidently confessing our known and unknown sins in the cosmic lullaby of God's love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. This frees and leads us to go into the world in our various vocations with welcoming service and help for our most vulnerable neighbors. Or as Paul Mines told us, the powerful melody of the song we lead is the great love of God and its unearthly harmony is about the first being last, the greatest being least, and a kingdom composed of children. Thanks.